All right, welcome everyone. My name is Lynn and I'm a senior scientist with Kyogen's Bioinformatics. Today I'm going to show you how you can relate the molecules in your data set to the body of information in the Ingenuity Knowledge Base using IPA core analyses. So this webinar is suitable for new users of IPA and also those of you who are a little bit more intermediate users and you want to learn a little bit more information about how to more effectively use the program. It's scheduled to last for 45 minutes and I'm going to spend about 40 minutes or so presenting and then I'll open it up for questions for the remaining time that we have today. And just a note, I won't be answering questions until the end of the presentation, but in the meantime, please go ahead and feel free to type in your questions into the question box as we're going along. That question box is located at the bottom of your GoToWebinar control panel. And I'm also recording this webinar and it will be made available to you to view later. And this is just a note that the software presented in today's webinar is for research purposes only. So this is the first webinar in our webinar series this month. Next week I'm going to show you how you can format and upload a data set and in the final webinar I'll explain how you can use IPA to answer your questions with or without data and I'll give you more information about when these webinars will be held at the end of the presentation. But first, I'd like to provide you with a short overview of the webinar. I'm going to begin by briefly describing the Ingenuity Knowledge Base, which underlies every algorithm that IPA performs. I'm going to tell you about the types of data and core analyses that you can perform in IPA and the, some of the questions that you can address using that data. I'll also introduce you to the two main statistical analyses that IPA uses to, to determine the levels of significance for your results. And I'm then going to introduce you to the data set that I'll use to show you the different core analysis results during a live demonstration. And then finally, I'll answer your questions. Okay, so let's begin by talking about the foundation of IPA, the Ingenuity Knowledge Base. So for many experiments, and in particular high throughput experiments, it can be very difficult to interpret data in a broader biological context and figure out how all the different pieces work together. And many of you have experienced the, the challenges of reading and interpreting all the publications that are necessary to really understand your research, and it can be quite time consuming. And so that's why we've developed the best in class knowledge base that contains a massive amount of information and includes millions of manually reviewed findings from the peer review literature, um, different pathways, we link to a whole bunch of different public databases and much more. And we have strict quality control procedures to ensure that the findings that underlie the knowledge base are accurate and timely. And then in addition to just providing you with that content, we have structured this content into something called the Ingenuity Ontology. So this combination of our knowledge base and the software algorithms enables you to quickly analyze and accurately interpret the biological meanings of your omics data. And currently, as of the end of September, the Ingenuity Knowledge Base contains greater than 6.9 million findings, and this number increases every week. Now there's different ways that you can explore and analyze I, um, data in IPA. And one way of course is to go ahead and upload your own data set and then go ahead and just run a whole bunch of different types of analyses in IPA. So we're gonna focus on this option today and also next week when I tell you about how you can format and upload your data into the program. Um, another, also what you can do in IPA is you can go ahead and use a bunch of different search tools. There's a tool called called BioProfiler and also design your own custom pathways. Um, and so I'll be talking about that for our third webinar. Okay, so I've told you about the Ingenuity Knowledge Base and I've told you um, also about how you can start to use the program. You can use it with data, you can use it without data. Now what I want to do is talk about well, what kind of data can you run, what kind of analyses can I perform, and what are the questions that I could address in a core analysis. 
So in IPA, you can upload gene, protein, or chemical data, and these are the five different types of core analyses that you could run. So the first one is the expression analysis, and so that focuses on gene or protein expression data, and the tox analysis allows you to assess how changes in gene or protein expression can drive toxicity and clinical pathology endpoints. The metabolomics analysis gives you insight into how the metabolism and cell physiology are affected by changes in the expression of metabolites, and you can also um, answer the same types of questions using gene or protein expression data. The variant effects analysis lets you understand the predicted impact of different variants in genes or proteins. And then finally, we have phosphorylation analyses. So this allows you to assess the impact of phosphorylated proteins on biological properties. And just wanted to make a really quick note here that this option is only available to those of you who have an advanced analytics license. So we call this the core analysis because it's the main functionality of IPA. And for all the analyses that I just um, listed on this previous slide, you'll get back answers to the following questions. So which signaling and metabolic canonical pathways are enriched in my experimental system? What upstream regulators are affecting molecules in the data set and how do they affect different diseases and functions? And which of those diseases and functions are overrepresented in my data? Which molecules are highly interconnected? So in other words, they're part of molecular networks and are therefore likely to be very biologically relevant for my system. And then which of these um, upstream regulators, pathways, et cetera, are predicted to be activated or inhibited? And then we can also ask which analyses show similarities or dissimilarities to my analysis. Now before I tell you about the data set and go into the live demo, um, I want to talk a little bit about the statistical analyses that we use. The reason for that is sometimes there's confusion about these two main types of statistics, so I want to just make it clear from the beginning what they are and how we use them in IPA. So there's two primary statistics that we use. We have a p-value of overlap and also a z-score. So I'm going to talk first about the p-value of overlap. So the null hypothesis for this test is that any association between the molecules in your data set and the molecules that are part of a pathway or a function, et cetera, is due to chance alone. So this p-value tells you the probability of getting your results or more extreme results if the null hypothesis is true. And we use a right tail Fisher's exact test to perform this calculation. And we consider a p-value that's less than or equal to 0 0.05 to indicate a statistically significant and non-random association. You also have the opportunity to correct for false positives using a Benjamin E. Hochberg um, correction for multiple testing, if you wish. Now, in addition, IPA uses z-score calculations for the data interpretation, and it does so in two ways. So first, it's used to make predictions about the activation state of the pathways, the upstream regulators, et cetera. And briefly, it does require that you have some sort of directional expression or phosphorylation data. And what it does is it compares the expression or phosphorylation patterns of the molecules in your data set with what's known in the literature and databases, in other words, the ingenuity knowledge base. And here a z-score that's greater than 2 or, um, or greater than or equal to 2 means that we're making a prediction that something is activated, and if it's less than or equal to minus 2, it means that we're making a prediction that it's inhibited. We also calculate a separate z-score for the analysis match feature. This feature seeks to identify other analyses that are very similar or dissimilar to your own. So here, the z-score that's greater than or equal to 2 means that we predict that two analyses are good matches, while less than or equal to minus 2 yields a prediction of an anti-match. So in other words, the two analyses show very different biological signatures. And just one more note about the statistics. The p-values are used to calculate significance in every analysis, but the z-scores are only used when we're talking about downstream effects, upstream regulators, and the analysis match feature. 
All right, so now I'm going to introduce you to the case study that I'll be using in today's live demonstration. And today, the study that I'm going to talk about is a data set that um, came from a study examining the effects of Jim Fibrozil. This is a drug used to decrease the amount of fat produced in the liver and lower the level of lipids in the bloodstream. It's commonly prescribed for patients with pancreatitis who have high cholesterol and triglyceride levels in their blood. And this drug is an agonist that activates the peroxisome pr proliferator, excuse me, activated receptor alpha. Um, this is a ligand-dependent transcription factor. And the receptor is highly expressed in brown adipose tissue and in the liver, where it's known to function as a lipid sensor. So that helps leads to the metabolism of carbohydrates and fats, as well as adipose tissue differentiation. So the analysis we'll be examining comes from a study that we downloaded from GEO, and it was RNA-seq data, and it came from a study that examined three different types of treatments, including the gem fibrozol. They took um, rats, and over the course of seven days, they um, treated them with 700 milligrams per kilogram, um, and they, we um, compared that to rats who had just been fed um, corn oil. Okay, now that our introduction is complete, let's go ahead and go into IPA. All right, so here um, I just want to very briefly go over the, um, the welcome screen right here. I, for today's webinar, I'm just going to focus on where you can go to start a core analysis and then introduce you to the other functionalities in the upcoming webinars. So first of all, we have this menu here where you can begin many of your different analyses or upload your data set. You can also go to the new button for many of the same um, functionalities. We have this quick start screen in the center and you can use these different analysis wizards to start an analysis. And then over here we have this project manager and you'll see this my project section. This is a folder where all of your data sets and your analyses are stored. So I've already uploaded that data set. I already ran the core analysis and I've opened it. So I'm going to go ahead and maximize that right now. So this is what you see when you double click on your analysis. This is the window that will pop up. And you can see that we have a number of tabs here at the top and I'm going to work my way through them one by one. And the first tab is called the summary tab. So you can see here that we have the top five results for each of the categories listed below, or excuse me, listed above, such as the top five canonical pathways. So you can see here we have a lot of cholesterol um, metabolism pathways that are, that are enriched. We have top upstream regulators, top diseases and functions, and so on. And we also include information about the top, um, the top 10, um, expressed molecules so and then the, the bottom 10 right the the ones that have the the smallest most negative full change values and we also have these statistics here as i mentioned before we have these p-values and we also have the predicted activity um, from those z-scores and if you like to say have this image exported or you want to take all this information and export it into a PDF, you can do that here or you can do both. You're going to see a lot of these little buttons that have arrows pointing to the right. That means that you can, there's some information on that page that you can export. Okay, so I want to move on now to the canonical pathways information. So here we're going to try to answer the question of which canonical pathways are enriched in these gem fibrozole treated rats. So you can see here we have this bar chart and it shows each of the enriched pathways. And it's a little hard to see. Um, I personally do not like to have my head turned towards the left all the time to read the pathway names on the bottom on the x-axis. So I switch it to make the view horizontal. So that makes it a lot easier to read. And we take the negative log, we graph this against the negative log of the p-value. Um, we use the negative log because it's a little bit more intuitive um, and, and it's easier to graph. So the taller the bar, the more significant the p-value. And we arrange them so that the most significant p-values are going to be shown at the top. As you can see, as I scroll down, the height of the bars become smaller and smaller. So everything that I'm showing you here has passed that cutoff of 0 
and that's represented by this orange line. So the negative log of 0 0.05 is 1.3. So that's located here. You can see that. Okay. Now I mentioned before that we also calculate z-scores and we make it really easy for you to quickly look and say, okay, well, which ones are activated or inhibited because we use color coding scheme. So orange means that um, something is activated, we're making the prediction of activation, and blue means we're making that prediction of inhibition. You might see white bars on your pathway, which means that the z-score is zero. So the weight of the evidence for a prediction of activation compared to the weight of the evidence for a prediction of inhibition were equal. So we can't make a prediction for activity. And then finally, we have the gray bars. So gray bars don't mean don't look at this pathway that it's not interesting, right? Because let's take the example of this FXR, RXR activation. It's the second most significantly enriched pathway in my entire data set. There are some pathways though in IPA where we can't make any predictions of activity. Just the way, the way it is, is that the, the data that we get, the information we have can't give us a confident prediction no matter whose data set that we use. So in these cases, we just make it a um, gray bar. We say there's no activity pattern that's available for you to view. Does it mean you should ignore the result? No, you shouldn't, but um, you just don't know what the activity is. All right, so we can look at a little bit more um, detail of this pathway. So I'm going to just use this example of LXR, RXR activation. You've probably noticed this blue bar or blue box popping up as I've been hovering my mouse. So this shows you the statistics for it. So I'll pick this one. It's got a nice, um, nice z-score, negative 3.4 and a great p-value. So here we can see the 31 molecules that are in my analyzed data set that are part of the pathway. And here are their symbols, the identifiers that I uploaded, and all the data measurement values that were in my data set. We also have an expected column. So this tells us how that gene or protein chemical is expected to behave, if you will, if that pathway were activated. And then we also have information about the location of this molecule, what type it is, what drug is are known to target it, and more. So if you want to read more about this pathway, you can go to the View Report button. It'll open up a new page in your default browser, and you can read all of the information there. And if you want to visualize this pathway, we can click on this Open Pathway button, and then we get this new window. I'll maximize it, make it a little bit bigger. So here you can see how all of the molecules are um, laid out within the, the cell and any sort of disease or functions that are associated with it. So here we can see that we have um, cholesterol biosynthesis, its transport, its metabolism, and much more are part of this pathway. So it's not surprising that this type of pathway is enriched. You can see that a number of these molecules have like a fuchsia colored outline. This is IPA's way of highlighting which of the molecules in your analyzed data set um, where they exactly are located. So you can quickly get move to it and go, oh yes, um, CD14 is right over there. And you notice that we have a color coding scheme here as well. So red or pink in an expression analysis refers to upregulation. In a phosphorylation analysis, it refers to an increase in phosphorylation. A green molecule means the opposite, a decrease in expression or a decrease in phosphorylation. And any molecule that's in gray is a molecule that was in your data set but didn't pass whatever cutoffs or filters you applied when you were setting up the core analysis. And then a molecule that's in white is just a molecule that's in the data set, not in your data set, but is part of the pathway. And if you ever wonder what the different shapes, what are the different line types, what all that means, you can go up to help and then go to legend, and there'll be a new page that opens up in your browser that'll tell you all of that information and much more. I'm gonna go ahead and close that out now. Click OK. And if you're interested in seeing which pathways have genes in common, what you can do is go to this overlapping canonical pathways tab. And so here you can see each of the canonical pathways has a red rectangular box. 
if there's a line that connects it, it means that there's some sort of one or more genes in common. And you can find out the number of genes by going to the show number of common genes. So for example, if I say, oh wow, there's six genes in common between these two pathways, what are they? I can click on that line and I'll get a, a table that'll pop up down here that'll tell me the identity of those six molecules. And you can also show the p-values and do further manipulation of the image as you wish. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to the upstream analysis. And so here we can ask, are there upstream regulators that are responsible for the patterns that I see in my data set? So I first want to go back to my slide to talk about this a little bit more. So IP considers any molecule that has a downstream effect to be an upstream regulator. So we're not just talking about transcription factors. This includes microRNAs and different drugs and much more. And IP is only looking for interactions that affect the expression of a molecule, its transcription, the, the protein's ability to bind to DNA and phosphorylation. And then just like the canonical pathways, we can compare what's known about upstream regulators and their targets from information in the ingenuity knowledge base and compare this with your data. And here we're looking for the overlap between these two sets. So let's go ahead now and go back into IPA and I'll show you what that information looks like. So here, um, this table is arranged so that each upstream regulator it has its own row and the upstream regulators that are the most significant via the p-value of overlap are going to be shown at the top of the table. And you can um, also, if you are interested in correcting for um, Benjamin E. Hochberg correction p-value, you can go to this customize table option and click there and it will add that column in as well. So you'll notice that if the upstream regulator is in your data set, that information will be listed here. So I have full change data and an expression analysis, so that's listed here. You've probably noticed, wait, she's got all these chemicals and she even has genes that are not in the data set. What's up with that? So we do, like I mentioned on the earlier slide, we're looking at any molecule that has an effect on your data set molecules. And so chemicals will be included. Sometimes um, this can get a little confusing for people because um, we have to keep in mind that you can activate an upstream regulator without inducing its expression. So there can be post-translational modifications that can occur on a molecule that allows for its activation, which then causes the um, the increase or decrease in expression of these upstream regulators target. So one of the nice things about IPA is we can get really take into account um, some of the complexities of biology by finding upstream regulators that aren't even in your data set. You can go ahead and sort by the type of molecule if you want to filter for that information. And then here we have our activation z-score and coupled with that we have the predicted activation state. So if you click on one, um, one of these headers, the other one will change. So if I want to have the activation, you know, sort everything by activation z-score, I just have to click on those headers. And then over here we have the target molecules in the data set. So this lists all the molecules and you can find more information about it by clicking on the hyperlink. So this all 60 opens up this upstream regulators for effects table and it lists all of the different genes here. So here we have um, phenofibrate is actually also a PPAR alpha agonist, which is predicted to be activated. And we can see based on every single gene in my data set why we're making this prediction. So for example, for ACOT1, um, it's upregulated and we know from information in the knowledge base that phenofibrate will cause the upregulation of this gene. So here we get a prediction of activation and we do that for each one of the genes. So here are 53 of the 60 um, are indicating that this molecule, that phenofibrate is probably activated. I'm going to go ahead and close that out now. All right. Um, and if you want to go ahead and say, all right, well, that's great. I, I'd like to see this visually you can click on the display as network after you select that. And this will um, show you a visual diagram 
with the upstream regulator in the center of the screen. Let me go ahead and maximize. There you go. So it's right there. And then all of the targets are in our outside. And there's a nice little prediction legend which tells you more about the different colorings of the lines and more. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and close that out. Now there's um, two other things that I'm not going to go over because we just don't have enough time. Um, mechanistic networks and also causal networks. So these are much more advanced options. They allow you to look at the effects of multiple upstream regulators. And in the case of causal networks, even master upstream regulators that can be having effects several um, nodes away several there might be a lot of intermediate regulators between a master regulator and the data set genes all right so now um, that we've talked about upstream regulators i want to move on to the diseases and functions so let's find out which diseases and biological functions are enriched so the first thing that always catches my eye is the heat map so i will talk about that first so here you can see that we've sized it um, by the negative log of the p-value. So in other words, the bigger the, the box, the more significant that particular function or disease category is. Um, but we can always change that to z-score if, if we like. Um, and you can also color by the z-score. You can color by the p-value, which is um, we chose colors of white and purple for that particular gradient. And then you can go through here and say, okay, well, metabolism is sterile. Um, as, I'm, as I showed you on that previous slide, we do have a hierarchy in the ontology. So lipid metabolism is at the top of this hierarchy, followed by these categories, metabolism is sterile. And when you click on that, you get the next level of the hierarchy that you could investigate. So we can click on that and then you get the next level until finally you click on one of these boxes, you get that same uh, downstream effects analysis, the evidence for effects, just like what we saw the upstream regulators. Okay, and you can always go backwards um, by clicking on any of these, these white hyperlinks. So I'm going to go back to the original view. And then down on the table, this information is very similar in that, but we've kind of skipped a lot of those intermediate categories, and we're just showing you the, the main parent category, um, and I guess it'd be the grandchild or great-grandchild category, the, the one that's at the very, very bottom. And so you can see the p-values, these scores, and also the um, molecules that are associated with it. Now, um, we also have a tox functions option. So um, upon customer request, we created some tox lists. And so we get that option available to you here. So you can see that there are some potential liver things that pop up, though z-scores don't appear to be that significant for most of them. Um, and just note, for those of you who've run a tox analysis, um, this is what you would see when you click on the diseases and functions tab. This is what you would see, and then you'd have to switch to this tab to see this information. Okay, so we've talked about how upstream regulators affect genes in your data set, and we just talked about how genes in the data set affect diseases and functions. So what might be really interesting to you is how can we link them all together? And that is the goal of the regulator effects. So I'm gonna go back to my slide for just a minute to talk to you about this concept. So what the algorithm does is it links regulators to the molecules in the data set and then separately it takes the diseases and functions and links them with molecules in the data set. And over the course of, of many iterations, it will link more and more of these nodes together. And then it will um, calculate from the most significant networks a consistency score. And that consistency score is based on how densely connected the network is and how causally consistent the information is from the upstream regulator down to that disease or function. So let me go ahead and show you the results for regulator effects. So um, we have each of the different networks gets an ID number and we rank it with the highest consistency scores at the top of the table. And then we have a node total and that's just the sum of the number of regulators which are listed here, the number of targets, those are here, and diseases and functions. And then we have this um, 
final column called known regulator to disease function relationship. So what this means is that, let's take the example of this first one, we have a 43%. So when this network was generated, 43 of the percent of the relationships between the regulator and the disease and function have been reported in the literature before. So six out of the 14, but there's eight out of the 14 that are novel that we can examine. So I'm just gonna choose, I saw metabolism of sterile, and we saw that on the diseases and functions. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pick that network. And let me maximize that. So you can see um, this is set up just the same way that we saw on that previous slide with the upstream regulators at the top, diseases, um, functions down here, and data set molecules in the middle. And it can be a little hard to, to see these different networks and their connections. So one thing I like to do is use our path tracer tool. So what this does is if I click on a node, it fades everything else that's not connected to it. So for example, for PPARD, I can see that it has, a, there's been a report in the literature that it has an effect on metabolism of sterol and that it has, um, let me hide that, um, it, it affects these four target genes. But it's part of this network and it's never been shown to have an effect on the synthesis of sterol. But we know that PPARD has an effect on these four genes and taking the example of SCD, we know SCD has an effect on synthesis of sterol. So therefore, it's possible that PPARD is involved in the synthesis of sterol. So these are things that we could go back into the lab and test um, if we find something really cool and interesting. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit OK. And just move very quickly onto networks. So here um, we can look at and ask what are um, data set molecules, what networks are highly interconnected. And then a neat thing that we can do from these networks is also find out which diseases and functions are associated with them. So here we um, have 25 different networks and we give them a network score and that network score is based on in part upon the number of focus molecules and by focus I mean molecules that pass the different cutoffs or filters that you set when setting up your core analysis. So the higher the score the more significant the set of molecules could be in your experiment. So you can see the names of the molecules are listed here if you want to see all of them you can click on this all 35 and it'll pop up and you can see some of them are in bold. So those are the, the ones that are in the data set. The ones that are not in the data set or were not um, analysis ready or not focus molecules will be um, not bold. Okay, and then we also have the top um, three diseases and functions associated with them. So here, perhaps not surprisingly, we find lipid metabolism, small molecule biochemistry, um, a lot of what we just saw with regulator effects and diseases and functions results. So if I wanna look at this, I can just click on any of these hyperlinks and now you can see um, all the different connections here. And then if you're interested in, okay, well, I've got 25 networks, are there any genes in common between them? You can go to overlapping networks. And just like we saw, like we saw with overlapping canonical pathways, we have rectangular boxes, this time they're blue. And if there were any genes or molecules in common, we would have the lines there. And the cool thing about this is you can merge different networks together. So you just have to double click on any line that connects them and boom, does it for you. All right, so now we have the lists and the My Pathways. And those are, um, you'll see that information if you had created lists or pathways and had saved them and approved them for future use. We have a Molecules tab that shows you all the information about your data set. And finally, we have Analysis Match. So for this final feature, I just want to go back into my slides and just briefly discuss, discuss it. Um, this allows you to automatically discover other analyses that give similar or dissimilar biological results. Um, and you can compare them against all the analyses that you've run in IPA. But importantly, you can also match to 57,000 plus 
publicly available data sets that we've downloaded from sources like GEO, SRA, etc. And we've used our omics soft software to process and curate that information. And then what we've done is we've taken those data sets, we've run core analyses on all of them, and we've placed them to place them into a special repository within this, the program. So let me go ahead and show you some results from analysis match. So I just mentioned that you can compare it against all of your data sets and the OMIC soft repository. Um, right here, I've just filtered it so you just see the OMIC soft information, but you can, you can do a whole bunch of different options as well. And by default, each um, of these, each, each row I forgot to mention is a matching analysis. Um, by default, the metadata that's listed here is the disease state. If there's a target gene, like from Lynx, that's listed here, the type of tissue that was used, the specific comparison. So in other words, was this a comparison of a treatment versus a control? Was it a disease versus a control, etc.? And then the specifics of that comparison. So okay, so it was the disease versus control. What was that disease? What was that treatment? And then we also have some web links so you can go and you can download that information for yourself if you wish. And we've got a lot of different metadata options. You can go to customize table and there's tons of different options that you can um, use and add to this table. And then over here we have um, these four different colors, purple and white and fuchsia and white. Um, and these stand for the Z scores and we also have P values for analysis match. So these are different z-scores than what I, we've been talking about for most of the presentation today. So for both the z-scores and the p-values, we look at four entities. We're looking at CP, canonical pathways, upstream regulators, you are, causal networks, so the master upstream regulators, CN, and DE stands for downstream effects, or in other words, diseases and functions. And we calculate a percentage match, and the overall z-score is just an average of the, those percentages. I don't have time to talk about um, the z-scores and the, how we make all these calculations. We do have a webinar that does go over this information that you can view on our um, website, and I'll, t I'll tell you about where to go for that website very soon. So um, what you can do right here is, you know, we have what 40, almost 45,000 um, results. So we can filter it down to something that's more interesting and relevant. So I'm just picking a number 45% match. And uh, just to get this number down to some more interesting. Yeah, so now we're down to 42. And you can see a new color popped up and it has a negative number. So we decided that it would be really interesting not just to show you what matches, but what doesn't match. So let's say that you're looking at a, a particular um, disease and you notice there's a treatment that is an anti-match to your analysis. Well, maybe that was a treatment you could use for your disease. So those are some, one of the, the ways that can actually be really helpful for using analysis match. So if you want to, you know, we've got these four different entities, you might say, well, what are driving the matches? There's tons of upstream regulators in the world, right? Well, what we can do is select, I'm going to select everything here, um, and you can view it as a heat map. We're going to get down into a, a little bit more of the, t the details about what's driving these different matches. And so here we have this heat map that's created. Um, you can see that our analysis is shown here in the pink and then all the other matches and anti-matches are shown in these columns. We can cluster the columns using this hierarchical clustering algorithm. So now the, um, the white adipose tissue that was treated with rosiglizotone, which is also, it's a PPAR gamma agonist, is very closely related as well as this one, to our gym fibrosome treated, and that's not surprising. And the, some of the most different ones have to do with the uh, white adipose tissue that has not been treated at all. 
And you can see down here um, the, the names of the different entities that are driving these similarities and differences. And we have a dendrogram right here. Um, so, show, so it shows you which ones are most closely related, if you will. Um, and of course, PPAR alpha is showing up um, as well as a bunch of other drugs that are involved with, uh, that are agonists for PPAR. Okay, and then you could go ahead and say, well, I'd really like to have, um, to go into even more detail, so you can click on a number of these different ones and then run a comparison analysis for up to 20 total. Okay, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and go back to my slides and give you a summary of what we've talked about today. All right, so um, we've identified, we've used IPA to address several questions. So first of all, we looked at um, enriched canonical pathways that, um, that were associated with the molecules in our data set. And our upstream analysis results allowed us to look for and identify upstream regulators that affected molecules in our data set. And the diseases and functions feature allowed us to find the significantly enriched diseases and biological functions. And then we were, I showed you how we could use a regulator effects results to link together upstream regulators to data set molecules and diseases and functions. And we found densely connected networks of data set molecules using this networks tool. We were easily able to identify using z-scores and color coding which molecules and different biological processes are activated or inhibited. And then we used the analysis match feature to discover other publicly available biological um, or analyses that had similar or very dissimilar biological patterns to this analysis. And there's much, much more that we can do in IPA. And today, I've really just given you a taste of what this software program is capable of. All right, so I hope that you now have a greater understanding about some of the core functionalities of IPA. I'd like to invite you to the next two webinars. So next week, I'm going to talk to you about how to format and upload your data sets and how you can start running an analysis so you can view the results that I've showed you today. And then we're going to end the webinar series where I'll have a webinar showing you how you can search and explore the contents of the Ingenuity Knowledge Base with, and very importantly, without data to answer your questions. Okay. And um, if you'd ever like to contact us, if you have any questions, any concerns, um, please feel free to go ahead and call us at any of these phone numbers. You can email us at ts-bio informatics at kyogen.com. If you're interested in getting a free trial or purchasing a license, you can contact bioinformatics sales at kyogen.com. And then here are our websites. And I mentioned before that I'm recording this webinar, and I've also mentioned over the course of the webinar that we have an analysis match webinar, and we also have a bunch of different video tutorials as well. Those are located at tv.kyogenbioinformatics.com. Other than that, uh, thank you all very much for attending. I hope to see you next week, and I will talk to you later. And thanks so much. Have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye, everybody. Kyogen. Sample to Insight.